My name is Regina Sedilkova. I'm the General Manager of Development Services for the Thompson Nicola Regional District. I've been at it for about 12 years and before that I was in central area planning and building in downtown Vancouver and on the coast. So um, I am here to uh, speak to uh, how we administer building permitting in the region. So that's the, all the electoral areas outside of reserve, outside of municipalities in, in the regional district. And it is a little different. We have a different bylaw. So I'll try to not overlap with what Ron spoke to. And we didn't plan this, but I don't think it will. We should be fine. OK, why is this not? Which button? Oh, ah, there we are. So I'm going to speak to a little bit about our building inspection service, our structure. You probably don't care about the values, the numbers. I'll go over some of this quickly. I only have about 15 slides, so I can focus on where we're at with the um, step code and the kinds of challenges we are seeing in the rest of the region. So what do we do? The TNRD is quite unique in that, as a regional district, we commenced build a building inspection service over 50 years ago across all the rural areas. Uh, most regional, or almost all regional districts, certainly maybe not the ones up by the Yukon border, um, but the rest of them around the lower mainland, island, and up to the Alberta border have a building inspection service in place now. Uh, so we do plumbing and building permitting. We used to do the building inspection for Merritt, but we just don't have the adequate staff for a complete rebuild. We have said if they want us back, uh, because we do six of the small municipalities. Each of them have their own bylaw, but we do their inspection for them. We issue their permits, we do their numbers, etc. It's a friendly contract where we share the liability. Um, once Lytton is rebuilt, if they want us back, then we're, we're ready. We just don't have the staffing for a full rebuild. The other thing that um, folks need to remember, building permitting, yes, it beams in and it administers the BC building code, but it also brokers things like for us in the rural areas or in municipalities, it's service connections to water, sewer. Um, in rural areas, it's septic filings with Interior Health to make sure somebody isn't putting a septic field along the property line right beside the neighbor's well. Um, it's looking for hazards. We, we, we generate the addresses when something is built and we feed those addresses into the whole provincial system for everything from 911 to BC Hydro, et cetera. So there's about 12 different entities. When we issue a building permit on a property, we look after all of that. Just the same as if there's a demolition permit, we make sure that building that's been demolished, you're not paying taxes on it. So we feed that through to BC Assessment, um, 911, Hydro, land titles, etc. Um, we also provide all, you know how you hear in the news, the housing starts? So we collect that information every month and we provide it from everything from StatsCan, CMHC, BC Stats, etc. So we're not big. Um, I look after planning, building, and bylaw enforcement. We do have a chief building official. Uh, he's really busy and so they sent me. <laughs> He knows more than I do. His name is Tony Bolton. We also have a, four field inspectors, one of which serves the electoral area outside of Lytton. Two in-house, one or two, two in the summer because we're just so busy where, where we crank it, the, the application rates really ratchet up in the spring and summer. And then we have a few building assist, assistants. And I wanted to show this. I, I'm sorry, the, the, there's so much light in here. But here's a beautiful home used on all kinds of um, promo stuff. This house could never meet the step code, <laughs> level three. This is for all kinds of reasons, mostly the windows on all sides. Or Lytton's bylaw. So our bylaw is a little different, and I'll speak to that in a minute. But I just picked that house on purpose because while it might be beautiful and it might be custom done, you would have to have to meet the, um, the step code, you'd probably have to have all kinds of equivalencies of heat pumps, solar panels, um, 
you know, geothermal heating, what have you, because you got to deal with the heat gain in, in the summer and the heat loss in the winter with all those windows. So this is the TNRD. Here's our four inspection areas. It's crazy big. Our inspectors spend, we call it windshield time. When they go up to Blue River, they're staying overnight. It is, it is, that's, I think that like a building service in a city, like whether it's Merritt or Kamloops, they have no idea of the kind of challenges we have. Um, so, but we've been at it for over 50 years and we've found a way to be very, very efficient about it and practical and we still, we follow, there's something called the core bylaw in BC. It was generated by our, our insurers. After 1988, no local government would get sued so much, and never mind the leaky condo crisis in the Lower Mainland. We had to have our own insurance company, and a lot of the lawsuits were over building. So in 1988, the Municipal Insurance Association of British Columbia was, was put together, and after they had their, their um, a few really major payouts, they created something called a core building bylaw. Most of their municipalities that are insured by these folks have this bylaw in place. So do all the six municipalities that we serve and all the, the rural areas. We do everything. So we don't just do footing, um, foundation, framing, final. We do the plumbing, we do the insulation. So the typical, like a standalone stick built, not a manufactured home or a modular that Ron was talking about, it's about 11 inspections, 10 to 11 depending. Um, it's a lot for, uh, for this area and we, do, we, ha we keep office hours in all our municipalities and that way folks from the rural areas, can, they don't have to drive all the way to Kamloops, they can where our main offices are. We had an inspector in Clearwater to serve the whole north, usually an hour, twice a week. And then we, um, because the fees are the same across the board and the bylaws are the same, it is different than Lytton's bylaw. Um, we do not, Lytton had special dispensation from the province for the bylaw that is in place in Lytton. Ours is the default, more or less the default core bylaw. And so we don't have the same um, demand for non-combustible construction. Ours is just the default BC building code. It's, it doesn't have the call for the impervious um, site considerations around the building. We are, as of May 1st, because that's when the step code became mandatory, so we are a step three, and that's what this is about, the step code. It can help explain it. But we've also, in our bylaw, we've um, added a provision where if people can't get an energy advisor, because, you know, there's some in Kamloops. I think there's four, um, and there's one here today. But the rest of the TNRD, to our knowledge, although people will be in Vancouver or there's folks in Calgary, there isn't any energy advisors, like, based in Clearwater or based in Merritt that we know of. There's people who will drive there. And um, so while, and so it's not about the money, but we've enabled two options, either performance way to meet the step code or prescriptive way to meet the step code. One isn't necessarily less money than the other, but one, if you can't get somebody who's able to drive to like near Valmont, it means by throwing in a whole bunch of extra insulation and throwing in like, uh, mechanical heat recovery ventilation, uh, better windows and doors, it means you can build, still get your building permit under the BC Building Code. So these are just our construction values. Here's, um, after the, we, we went right down after 2008 and it's been quite busy since growing with the same staff. We do a lot of enforcement um, because, like in a municipality, you, you generally can't build a house without a building permit because you're not going to get your water and sewer connection. In rural areas where people are off-grid and they're on their own wells or um, groundwater wells or surface water 
or septic field. It's just a part of the job. Uh, what we usually do, we have a board policy we follow. We put notices on title. When you have a building service, as as per our insurers, you must regulate. You can't just turn, you know, somebody's building a house over there, you can't just say, well, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. That comes with the territory. So it's not like, because I also look after bylaw enforcement, it's not like if somebody has an unsightly premise, we don't do anything until we get a complaint. With construction, it's a little different. If we're aware of it, there's a liability. So we routinely, if something's built without a permit, we put a notice on title. It's called a 57, Section 57, and that's just the provision of the community charter that covers it, and the green ones that are, are ones that are removed. So we, it basically alerts people. So if you're buying a house and there's a notice on title, you will note, and then you come to us, and we tell you why we put the notice on title. You know, it's a, somebody built it without a p permit. They didn't get occupancy, or they didn't build it outside the flood plain like they promised with the building permit issuance, or there was just no permit whatsoever. So we also have a civic address, addressing program, and that is critical in rural areas if there's emergencies. Um, so we give you a sign for free. We just need you to post it. And if you don't post it, you're in trouble. You'll hear from me. Um, so I want to say, like, because I deal with a lot of historic permits. And our liability period used to be 30 years. 30 years if something went wrong with the house. And then a couple years ago, the province brought it down to 15 years. Thank you very much. Because the thing about like why we had our own insurance is a thing called in BC legislation, joint and severable liability. So if something goes wrong with a house that was built 15 years ago, the contractor may not be around. The plumber may not be around. So even if the local government who issued the building permit and did the inspections was only found 10% found culpable, if nobody else is left to pay, we're paying it all. And that's really why we have an insurance company and why we have a core bylaw and why we conduct the service the way it is. Um, this, is this, little, this is like a little envelope, and it's probably about as thick as this book. Oh, I don't want to mess that up. That's, that's how thick it is. And that was around the 70s, 80s, and even this permit was 2000. That's a building permit. Now, and Ron can back me up on this, this in 2022 is a building permit. The amount of, and that's before the step code even, because now it's going to be more complicated because you need to, rather than buying that Genish house plan, which it probably would be to BC building code, and then getting a site plan, putting it on the site, maybe flipping it over mirror-wise, mirror there, there's been one addition to, and of all the things we look after with zoning, variances, all the different kinds of development permits that we, we broker, the thing that has changed the most in the last 20 years is building permitting. Okay? It's become much more complex. The days of, you know, Uncle Bob, he can swing a hammer and he's just going to build his own house are done. I would say. Legally, you can still do it, but you have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. In other countries, like I've worked in other provinces and I've worked in other countries, um, like in Europe, you, people don't build their own houses. It is a profession and you need engineers and architects, even if you're doing an addition in most of Europe. Canada was quite different. I mean, I think it's because there's so much land and there was a different kind of frontier approach to construction, but this really has changed. So now, with um, the building code, you pretty all houses have pretty well all houses have engineered trusses, floor systems. You often need a geotechnical engineer to design your footing and your foundation or geohazards. Now you also need a community energy advisor. Uh, for the most construction, that's what Ron was speaking about. And this is somebody who evaluates the plan. They model it. There's a whole bunch in this little brochure that explains community energy advisors. Um, so you do, rather than just dropping a house on a property, 
Now you have to look at which way the sun goes. Where is the heat, the, could the heat be gained in the summer? So maybe having overhangs a foot deeper makes a huge difference. Or having triple pane glass on some windows but not others. Or having less windows. Like that house I showed you would probably not be able to be issued a building permit today. Um, so yeah, between Homeowner Protection Act, um, more complicated building code, the step code. Uh, I mean, for us, it's also filings for septic fields. In municipalities, we don't really have DCCs, development cost charges in the rural areas, but a lot of municipalities have that as well. It's, we are now building, I think, in, in British Columbia for a longer time frame. And, you know, I, I'm not here to say that, it, that this is, all this extra bureaucracy and process is good or bad. I'm just here. These, these are the facts. And um, a lot of people who maybe have, aren't in the industry are not aware of this. And they come to the counter, and we don't even know where to begin with, um, no, you can't build this like that. In the rural areas, because for the most part we're looking at much bigger properties, it's less of an issue with that limiting distance, the fire separations to the property line and the neighbor's house. We certainly have to deal with it in manufactured home parks. And what we are seeing a whole bunch more of progressively as a proportion every year, because it's so expensive and hard to get a contractor, it is the, proce the processes are more complicated. So for better or worse, every year we issue more permits for manufactured homes, so the Z240s, which it's a CSA Z240, it's a standard that uh, is across Canada. It has to be like the, the snow loads, wind loads, etc. cetera, the, the bearing is for the site, but the, the assembly construction is uh, Can Canadian Standards Association is CSA. And that, those, we're seeing more of them. Uh, single wide, double wide, or offset, what have you. Or sometimes they put them on a permanent foundation. So they're not in, in manufactured home parks. They're in rural areas, because it's the fastest way to get a roof over your head. Um, I'm not going to go over this. I prepared this for our municipalities, because they're like, why is it taking you so long to issue a building permit? This, this is. And this isn't even including the steps with the step code. We go over all of this. Um, like the, a couple years ago, the contaminated sites profile was added to building permitting. It used to be um, for subdivision. It was, it was the only for a few things. Now, it was triggered only for a few things. Now, any building permit which disturbs soil requires a... Um, completion and review under the contaminated sites regulation. So this is where we go through all of this, so we make sure it's complete when we, before we even look at the building code, then the bottom half of that is, this is what we review until finally, ta-da, we can issue the building permit and you can start building. So, you no, know, in municipalities, there's municipalities tend to, the six municipalities we contract for, most but not all do their own zoning reviews. They'll issue the address. They'll deal with servicing. Um, the other thing I'd forgotten, this is the Riparian Area Protection Act. That in the TNRD definitely impacts a lot of construction that's um, near or on lake shores or riverfront or creek front. Um, this is what, so this is the planning review, and this is what our in-office um, building inspector checks. He does something we call a red line. He reviews the drawings. The step code review would be a part of that, and then we issue the permit. So when there's losses due to a, we call them sole, a state of, or state of local emergency, these, they get a special little sticker on the end. And so this could be a flood, a fire, wildfire, or even any other. 
not, not a regular fire, but a state of local emergency, so that's typically wildfire. So we take, we allocate special staff to help them through the process. We certainly did this after the 2017 and the 2018 fires. Um, we give them, we, we, we have a sale on building permits. We eat the cost of 50%, or not just building permits, any application that you need to do, because you might need a rezoning or a variance, 50% off. And we bump them ahead to the front of the queue. Especially, and this is whether insurance companies are involved or not. Because you still, the point is the person needs a place to live and wants a house with a roof over their head. And that's the primer. I'm not going to go over all of that. You can have that. And it's available. We have lots of, I brought some, but they're all online. Checklists, um, the say, a lot of them would be the same as what Lytton would have. This is what you need to apply for a building permit. This is your, you know, how do you know what you, how do I check my zoning and then so what? So all of those guides are online or they're available for free in our offices. Um, this is from here. So step three is what became mandatory as of May 1st of this year. Um, next year, right now it's voluntary, but next year the province is going to make calculation and limits on greenhouse gas emissions, mandatory. So if people want a gas stove and um, gas furnace and gas hot water tank, uh, that, that will become problematic. So there's going to be some calculations and trading. I don't know how that will work. That's, uh, that will be seen. I don't know if it's going to be. They said it's going to be next year, but sometimes they're a little slower. But it is coming. And my last, I think I'm out down to my last slide, next to my last slide. As I said, the performance code is your qualitative review, how to meet step three. The province has enabled, because there was a lot of squawking from rural places and places in the, like I call it the back of beyond, we in our bylaw have also enabled the prescriptive code where you don't need to do the blower test. You don't model, you don't need to hire that extra consultant, the community energy advisor, but you're sticking a whole bunch of an extra layer of insulation in, better windows and what have you, and this this can end up costing you more money. But in the end, you'll get if you're paying those bills, you'll get you'll get you'll save it if it's your own house. Um, it was funny because I've done I've built a house for my family a few times. And I was thinking, well, which one would I choose? Because it really, if, you know, if you, the, the kind of houses, and I told our board of, our elected board of directors this, I anticipate that it's the houses in Tobiano, the really high-end million-dollar houses, they're going to go, because they're going to want those big windows. They're going to go with the community energy advisor and modify the design and, you know, kind of go through that process. Whereas the people, you know, in really remote rural areas that aren't getting a manufactured home, they're probably just going to stick more insulation in the walls and be done and do a simpler, smaller house. So, um, and be done faster. And I think that these, these, there, there will be some huge challenges on the horizon in certainly in, in the areas where I work, um, I'm, I'm in touch with people like in Metro Van and the Lower Mainland and on the island. And there, the challenge for the, with the changes, all the changes we've seen to the building code, and I'm not sure all the other changes that will be coming with the new code that's supposed to be issued late this, later this year that will um, become effective mandatory January 1st of 2024. I, um, I think it's harder, the more remote you are, the more rural you are, the harder it is to meet, meet the requirements. And I think that there is some focus in Victoria with the folks who write the code. In, they're looking and focused more on their own backyard. That's just my observation for what it's worth. And that's it.